on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. In this series, Mike, I've noticed that we have touched on the subject of Jesus' authority when perhaps he's been teaching in the synagogue. So let's just explore that a little bit further, his authority. And we've come to a particular church in Jerusalem. You'll explain why in a second or two. But uh, just, just remind us of what the New Testament says about his authority. Well, he has authority quite simply because he is revealed as the promised messianic king. And the very nature of the kingdom of God is that the king has authority and that both people and circumstances and events have to respond to his authority. Now, that's real authority. Lots of people in life claim to have authority, uh, but they have no power to do anything about it. You know, they're sitting in a position, but try their best, they can't change anything. But Jesus is revealed as the promised messianic king who really does have authority. And that's demonstrated a whole number of both miracles and teachings throughout the four Gospels. So where's our focus going to be this time? Well, obviously, we just need to pick out one story because there are so many. So we've chosen to look at John chapter 5, which is the story of Jesus' authority being seen through a quite significant healing at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Is that where we are? We are. We are sitting in the courtyard right outside the church of St. Anne, and it's in the grounds of St. Anne's church that we find the remains of the Pool of Bethesda. Uh, this particular church here, right alongside us, is the second oldest crusader church in the whole of the Holy Land. It's about a thousand years old. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. And it's a very simple church inside, done in white limestone, both inside and out. And its windows, high up, are very small, as you'd expect in that period, a very simple church. But as you go down into the crypt, you come to the bedrock on which the church is built. And there in a corner of the crypt is the remains of a cave from the first century, which is claimed to be the home of Mary, the mother of Jesus, her parents, uh, Anne and Joachim. Now, where's that in the Bible? It isn't anywhere. It is a tradition, a church tradition, quite simply. But this is seen as the place where Mary and her parents would have grown up. And it's in the grounds of that church that we find these remains that we're going to be thinking about and talking about and the story behind it today. So not just the church that people come to, but to see these ruins, these amazing ruins, actually, right next door. Yeah, you know, when we read the story uh, in a moment from John's Gospel, what I'd like listeners to remember is that just a few years ago, there were many scholars who dismissed this story completely, saying it was a complete fabrication, something that John had made up to try and help undergird his portrayal of who Jesus was. Why? because they simply hadn't found this pool with its five porticos. And I've discovered in life, if you just wait a few years, you can guarantee that archeologists will just dig a bit deeper or dig a bit further and find something new. And that's exactly what happened here. As they began to dig and excavate, uh, they started saying, hello, what's this? And dug deeper and deeper and deeper until as we look over the edge now, I don't know, to guess, probably 40 feet down from the level that we are now on today, there's the ground level of this pool where this miracle happens, and we can still see some of the huge arches that formed part of this portico that John tells us about where this story happened. Very precise details then in the Bible that help us in that sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there are... Uh, the remains we can see uh, of pillars on the four sides confirming there would have been five roof colonnades or stowers as they were called so an exact confirmation of the existence of this place which only a few years ago people were saying couldn't possibly have happened well there it is right in front of us and the purpose of these pools well the main purpose of this particular pool the the water 
was brought here from the nearby springs. We know that there were lots of channels and aqueducts, particularly developed in Roman times and the times of King Herod. And these particular pools were believed to have a, a curative benefit. It's a bit like some of those spas that you get around the world today where people uh, you know, go to take the waters, as it used to be called, because of the healthy minerals that are within them. So the pools were used largely as curative pools, spa pools, we might say today. But I just discovered something now from a local guide who was telling me something that I actually didn't know, that one of the pools was actually used to bathe the sheep before they were taken to the temple for sacrifice. We're right by the Sheep Gate. It's actually called Lion's Gate today in modern Jerusalem, but it was called the Sheep Gate in New Testament times. So it makes sense they would have come right through there, just a hundred yards or so to where we are, uh, and would have come here, been washed, so they were purified again and then taken to the temple and inspected there. But they were primarily curative pools in the time of Jesus. So there were people gathered around those pools with all sorts of conditions and health issues with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and that perhaps just is a good point for us to read the story and, and to see what it tells us. So here it is. Uh, we're in John chapter 5 from verse 1 where we read this. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, we're not sure which one it was, but it would have been one of the three great festivals, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, when every Jewish man was obliged to come to Jerusalem and come to the temple. And Jesus, being a good, devout Jew, would have fulfilled that. So here he is in Jerusalem. He's come down from Galilee for one of these festivals. Coming for a particular purpose. Absolutely though the purpose would turn out to be perhaps different from what was seen at first. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. That means house of mercy, house of healing even, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I've no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Now the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, It is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But the man replied, The man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. But later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Now stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who'd made him well. So in those days, near where we are, there was this pool with these people with these terrible conditions. This man had been poorly for 38 years, paralysed for 38 years. When Jesus, who was on his way to the festival, sort of, by the sound of it, takes a bit of a detour to this place, asks him a rather strange question, doesn't he? He does. Do you want to get well? Well, he would have thought the answer to that was blindingly obvious, wouldn't you? Of course he wants to get well. He's been an invalid for 38 years. That meant he probably couldn't work. That meant he couldn't earn. That meant he was probably dependent on the charity of others. A really hard life. Why would he not want to get well? Well, you know, I've been a pastor long enough to know that that question is not as stupid as it first sounds. Because if I can say this tenderly, you know, when we've had 
a long-term illness, it can almost in an odd way become our security blanket. It almost starts to define us. It almost starts to put certain pegs down about what we can and can't do and who we can and can't be. And it almost becomes in a strange way, painful as the condition might be, disabling as it might be, it almost becomes like a familiar friend. And if this familiar friend goes, what then? What might be expected of me? What might I be expected to do? Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that every person who ever has a long-term sickness or disability would feel like that. But I've been a pastor long enough to know there are certainly some in life who end up feeling like that. And it looks like Jesus saw through a word of knowledge again that that was what was going on with this man. And so he asked him this fundamental question. Do you want to get well? The whole subject, actually, of long-suffering is something that perhaps doesn't get talked about sufficiently. We're in an instant culture where we're expecting instant results. But as you said, tenderly, people have been suffering with things for a long, long time. What does faith say about that? You're absolutely right. Our culture today is the now culture. It's the instant culture, isn't it? It's the culture of get your phone out and there's the answer. But we probably all live long enough to know life's not always like that. There are some things that take longer and, you know, sometimes sickness doesn't get dealt with quickly. Sometimes it can take some weeks or months for us to recover. Sometimes there are conditions from which people never recover and despite the much praying that goes into it and I think you know I've known people who have had long-term illness who have prayed and prayed and prayed to be healed and yet not been healed and have just had to come to the place of thinking well Lord I don't know why you haven't I know you can I have no doubt about your authority to deal with this but for some reason you haven't I'm going to keep on asking you because I can't not ask you but I'm also going to put myself in a place of dependence on you and trust in you and believing that you know the best. And for now, in a way, I find it hard to understand, if I'm honest, that this is the right place for me to be in until you change that or until you call me home to you. So I think what faith says is, yeah, there are times to reach out in real faith and ask Jesus to do something. In fact, I think it's always right to do that. But there are times when we don't see an answer, when faith then says, so will you trust and will you wait, no matter how long that waiting and that trusting might have to be. Not only was it strange for Jesus to ask that question, but it was a bit strange that he didn't just pray for the man. <laughs> it is. I mean, the whole thing that follows on from there is, is odd, isn't it? I mean, wh why this man, first of all? You know, there's all these others around, but for some reason this guy grabs his attention, he asks that question. His answer also slightly, well, understandable, I suppose. He said, yeah, the trouble is, Jesus, I've no one to get me into the pool when the water is troubled. Now, these pools were fed by underground springs. And so obviously, if you got a bit of a surge in the spring from snow melt or whatever it might be, the river swollen where the springs were coming from or the channels were coming from, you get a bubbling up of water and the sort of belief had arisen that it was the angel of the Lord troubling the waters. Now is the time to get in. So the, here's an interesting thing. The man's focus is not on God. The man's focus is on the pool. The reason I'm still in this condition is because I can't get in the pool. And it just strikes me how very easy it is for our focus to sometimes slip to the things of God rather than to the God of things. And this had clearly happened with this guy. He, he, he wasn't looking to God to heal him. He certainly wasn't looking to Jesus to heal him. He had no idea who Jesus was. He, he says, it's, it's the pool. If, if only I, I could get into the pool. And the trouble is, um, when the water bubbles, everyone gets into the pool before me and I'm... It was like first in gets it, as it were, it was believed. So I'm always left on the side. And, yeah, you asked that question about what it was that Jesus said, because it was indeed 
Strange, what Jesus does here is not what he does in many other instances of healing. Um, he doesn't lay his hands on him. Um, he doesn't speak a word of healing. He doesn't command a demon to flee or anything. He says something, frankly, which on the face of it looks quite ridiculous. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Now, hello, Jesus. <laughs> this is my problem. Yeah. I can't get up and walk. And Jesus is here telling him to do the very thing he cannot do. And this is Jesus using his authority. Absolutely. And somehow, in some way that the text doesn't go into and explain to us, something happened in the man at that moment and that authority hit home. There was, I'm sure there were other people who must have said in time, could you, could you not just try and walk? Could you just not try and get up, you know? Um, but this simple word, get up, pick up your mat, walk. There must have been something about that, either, was it the way he said it? Was it the tone? I don't know, but there was some clear authority in his voice that led to the next verse at once. The man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked. There he is lying on this mat by this pool here just alongside us and suddenly again put put yourself into the picture perhaps imagine how it might have been lying there did, did he feel some tingling in his legs or something did he suddenly feel the atrophied muscles getting stronger i don't know something happened in response to that authority of jesus because he instantly then gets up he knows he's cured and he's instantly up on his feet and he's walking. Have you any idea why Jesus simply used his authority on this occasion but would have healed people in other ways elsewhere? Well, you know, I mean, I suppose the short answer is, you know, we don't know because we're not told, but I think the context probably gives us a clue. And I think it's a pretty reasonable clue. Where is he? He's not in Galilee now where so many episodes have been set where he ministered among the poor and needy and the marginalized. He's in the bastion of religion. He's here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem in those days was utterly dominated by the temple. The main sanctuary of the temple you would have seen from wherever you were in Jerusalem in those days. It was the only huge building towering up like that, apart from the Antonia Fortress right on the corner of its courtyards huge courtyards next to it. The temple dominated. And who dominated the temple? Well, sadly, it wasn't God. It was the Sadducees. It was that priestly family who had, over the generations, accrued the power to themselves to say, if you want forgiveness, you have to come to us and through us. We are the people who offer sacrifices for you. We're the only ones you know, who can ensure that you come into a right relationship with God. And at one level, that was right because God had established that in the Old Covenant. But it, it's like they'd aggregated this to themselves, appropriated it to themselves. So they were the sort of religious mafia. Do you know what? It's a brilliant picture. And I think that's how Jesus saw them. And it's as if he comes into the very centre, the very heart of Jewish faith that had all gone so terribly wrong and does something here that he knows is going to upset, yeah, the Jewish mafia leadership, which, of course, it does as the story goes on. Well, do read on and remind us. Well, let's read again. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, the Jewish day of rest. And so the Jews, and by the way, just need to say, whenever John in his gospel talks about the Jews, uh, he doesn't mean the whole of the Jewish people. It's John's shorthand way of meaning the Jewish leaders, these, yeah, the religious mafiosi, the, you know, the Sadducees, the Pharisees who were committed to living out the law in micro detail and all their laws that the scribes had added. So maybe when I come to that, I'll, I'll just put the Jewish leaders just to help us remember that. 
So the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who'd been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Let's, let's just stop there. Because here is a man who would have been well known. For 38 years, he has been lying by these pools. These pools where pretty much everyone would have come, you know, to take the waters, to, to enjoy their refreshment, whatever it might have been. And here's this man who's an invalid for this whole long period. They, they would have known him. And suddenly he's healed. And their first question, you know, isn't sort of, wow, how did that happen? How pleased they should have been for him. Absolutely. There's not a hint of that. The only thing these Jewish religious leaders are worried about is, excuse me, this is the Sabbath and the law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, actually, the law did not forbid you to carry your mat. <laughs> the law forbade you to work on the Sabbath. Went right back to the Ten Commandments. Six days you shall labor and on the seventh you shall rest. It was meant to be a, a day of refreshment and renewal and restoration so that you could give yourself to work again the rest of the week. They've added some terms and conditions. Oh, so many terms and conditions you wouldn't have time to read all the small print because the small print they had added was absolutely huge. You know, it originally came out of a good heart when God's people were exiled to Babylon in 586 BC when the Babylonians came and destroyed this city and the temple and they were carried off into exile for the 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied. While they were there they started to think how did we end up here and as they look back on their history and the books of 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Samuels were written up it's clear that you know they saw that they'd ended up there because of disobedience. So the next question to follow was, well, if we don't want to end up in exile anymore once we get back, what do we need to do? And the answer was, we need to be obedient. We need to obey the law because it was disobedience to this law that got us here. And so from that time, starting in the exile, but particularly proliferating in the time they returned from exile, the rabbis began to add explanations, it started out with, of what labor, what work meant. And they literally started listing all these things that you could and couldn't do. Started with a good heart to make sure we never anger God again and end up in exile. But as with so many human-made religious rules, the human-made rules end up becoming bigger than the God-given rules. My goodness, we've seen that in every denomination throughout the church over history. And so their concern here is frankly not for the law, but rather for their interpretations of the law, which, yes, said you shouldn't pick anything up and carry it. But they'd lost completely any sense of joy, thanksgiving to God that this guy had been healed. So their authority is being challenged by Jesus' authority. Oh, absolutely. That's a really good way to sum it up, David. And we know that they didn't like their authority being challenged. Um, and so they, you know, they come to this guy and say, well, well, who is he? Who is it who told you to do this? And the guy says, well, you know, the man who made me well told me to pick it up. Don't ask me. It was him. You know, well, who's him? And here's a fascinating thing in the story. The man who was healed had no idea who it was. Wow. Talk about the kindness of God. He does not know it's Jesus. He does not know he's Messiah. He does not know he's the Son of God come into the world to forgive our sins and to put things right. Just knows he's this bloke who walked past all these pools and he said, get up. And I got up and I walked off. That literally is how the story goes. And it's only later when Jesus sees him up at the temple, because remember he's come here for one of those great festivals and comes to the temple. He sees the guy again and goes to him and says, see, you're well, aren't you? And then an interesting thing, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, that does not mean the every act of 
sickness or being disabled is the result of sin. Scripture makes that very plain. But it does look like in his case, there was something in his life that it started out with sin that had ended up somehow in this condition of disability. And so Jesus now gets to the heart of it and says, listen, it's not just about your body being well, your spirit and your soul needs to be well as well. So he knew the man's backstory, shall we say. Clearly the religious authorities didn't. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's, it's through one of these words of knowledge that we've referred to in previous episodes where the Holy Spirit gave him information he could not have known by any human means. So, ultimately, then, what was the reaction of those religious mafia types to Jesus' authority? Well, they are livid by what has happened. In fact, it's interesting, John chapters 5 to 10, that whole section of John, contains a series of escalating conflicts between Jesus and the religious authorities. And it all comes down to the religious leaders not liking their authority to be challenged, as you said. Um, you know, they were in control, thank you very much. They made the rules, thank you very much. They decided who was in and was out, thank you very much. And the last thing we need is some upstart rabbi supposed healer from Galilee and Nazareth, wherever that is, coming and exerting his authority and trying to trump our authority. But of course, the uncomfortable thing was, was that his authority had been proved and demonstrated. He had said to this man who could not get up, get up, and he got up. There, before their very eyes, was authority that they could not deny. And so because they could not deny it, they would eventually destroy it and destroy him. So how essential is it for us to recognise Jesus' authority today? I think it's fundamental because in recognising his authority, we're recognising him as king. Now, you know, most countries in the world these days don't have a king that has absolute power. And even those of us like the UK that does have a king and for many years did have a queen, uh, a ruling monarch, it's really a constitutional king and queen that, that really had no authority. But when we come to biblical times, a king had real authority. He said it and you did it. And so this whole thing about thinking about Jesus as authority, you know, we often think, oh yeah, his authority, you know, his authority to me to go out and preach, amen. His authority to go and pray for the sick, amen. His authority to teach the good news, yes, amen. But actually, first and foremost, his authority is about all of us bowing our knee and acknowledging him as king. And it's only when we acknowledge him as king, not just once, some years ago, when we first received him into our lives as our saviour, but day after day after day, bowing our knee and saying, King Jesus, I yield to your authority. You have the final say, you have the final word in my life today. And here I am making myself available to you for you to do whatever you want through me because today is not about me and my skill and my ability and my authority i want today to be your channel your vessel for your authority into wherever you send me and who knows what jesus might do with his authority if every day we bowed our knee to him at the start of the day and said king jesus here i am Use me for whatever you want today. Well, as we reflect on how Jesus demonstrated his authority over the life of that man who'd been paralysed for 38 years, just feet from where we are, at this pool of Bethesda here in Jerusalem, just pray for us now as we reflect on his authority for us. Heavenly Father, help us not to focus on the wrong things in life like that man focused on the pool rather than on you. Help us not to focus on 
religious places or religious people, but to remember you are the one who has authority, you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us each day to bow our knee to Jesus as King and to invite him to use us so that as we yield to his authority over our lives, we too might be surprised at how that authority gets demonstrated in us and through us as we yield to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises.